Hey everybody, happy new year. Welcome to 2020, the first PR Tech Wednesdays of the year. Uh, I am joined by my old friend, Jay Bear. Eric, how are you? Happy New Year. Hello, everybody out there. Nice to be here for uh, on the big, the big Wednesday live chat. You know, um, I was looking for, there's a photo that I had, I couldn't find it, of you and me on a WorldCom panel in Tennessee where we met 20 yeah, years Nashville. ago. Yes, that was my first WorldCom event. Yeah, and that was a long time ago. Yep. I remember mm -hmm. having barbecue afterwards in the park. Yes, indeed. I miss those days. A lot yeah. has happened since then. That seems like about 50 years ago. Damn, a lot has happened. So, you know, you started in PR, but you don't call I yourself did. or you don't call what you do PR anymore. Yeah. So what changed, PR or you? Um, well, I think both. You know, anybody who has been in PR longer than two years would, I think, agree that, that the role of public relations has changed in reaction to or, or in lockstep with the change in how people worldwide get information, right? I mean, I, I still get a daily newspaper, too, a day, in fact, but that is definitely the exception that proves the rule. Uh, and, and there are, of course, fewer journalists in the, in the whole notion of traditional media versus uh, digital media and influencers. It's just all quite a bit different. So, uh, I I got out of uh, kind of traditional public relations, if you will, fairly early in my career, and and I was um, fortunate enough, I guess, to to get involved in digital very very early uh, in 1993, really before any of this existed, and so over time, sort of became more and more digitally focused. And, and so now I primarily work on uh, digital marketing strategy and, and customer experience strategy. But but certainly some of what my team and I offer to our corporate clients uh, touches on the realm of uh, of public relations. And we certainly have lots of relationships in the public relations technology industry and, and uh, whether whether everybody chooses to call it that uh, anymore or not. So most of the research I've done shows that, oh, by the way, everybody, this is our new mascot. This is Ace. So, best uh, uh, best Ace. question uh, today, wins the dog. It's an amazing new promotion that we're doing. Uh, no, you don't no. win the dog. The oh, dog's okay. all mine. Okay. So, okay. okay. So look, um, you know, so much of, of, of what we do in PR these days happens in digital environments. Yet, most firms today are still either media relations or digital marketing agencies first, one or the other. Yeah. So, so if you're smaller and you can't afford to hire two agencies, is it better to hire a PR agency that can do online marketing or an online marketing agency that can do PR? Well, I mean, I guess I would argue that the remit of online marketing is typically broader today because from a tactical standpoint, that could include things like website, email, messaging, live chat, social content, a bunch of other things, um, digital analytics, and while there are certainly uh, several, many uh, great, what we might consider to be communications or PR firms who can do some or all of that work, generally your digitally focused organizations are gonna have a broader set of services. So I think if you're looking for an end-to-end -end solution, somebody like, okay, do all the digital, do all them computer things for me, um, then probably a digital agency would be the best bet now my, I don't know that it works as well the other way around, right? So, so let me let me put it to you this way: If you accept the premise that public relations is about influencing publics, right? It's it's about changing perception, and and therefore incentivizing behavior change that trails uh, belief change. There are not very many digital firms that are good at that. Now they may say they are, but they're typically not. So I guess the, the cleaner way to say this, Eric, would be. Um, you probably should have one of both. <laughs> like I like, you know, the PR firms can be very good at digital. They're just not very good at all digital in my estimation. And digital firms can be kind of good at PR, but they're usually not. So, you know, your, your definition of PR is spot on, you know, from, from an insider's uh, perspective, sure. from an yeah. intellectual insider's perspective. But the truth is most people, particularly early stage startups and even you know, VC funded startups are often 
drawn to PR by the promise of third-party endorsements, namely mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. coverage. Yeah. And that, of course, you know, extends into social media influencers as well. That's right. <clears throat> but but if if what I want is media coverage, yeah. do I go to a PR firm? And then what I, if what I want is online communications, then do I go to a digital marketing firm? Is that how I should think about yeah. it? I, mean, I think I think if you kind of go back to the to sort of the peso model, right, of paid, earned, uh, shared and owned, if what you're looking for is truly earned media, uh, therefore, some sort of third party is is bestowing credibility upon you. Then, then usually, what most executives want that comes from quote unquote traditional or quasi traditional media. And I find that that public relations practitioners and, and organizations are usually a better bet in that because again, it's still a relationship business, right? Um, there, there is no there is no end game um, that or end run, I should say, around relationships. So if, you, if you're talking about um, ink, right, in the in the classic sense, then then I think PR is still the place to go. If if you're looking for shared media or or more straight up kind of what we've now considered to be in some cases influencer marketing, then I think maybe you you could um, uh, look at it a little bit differently. Of course, depending on, on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, that's the problem I have with influencer marketing as a discipline. People look at it from a campaign standpoint, right? Uh, they look at it from a marketing standpoint, not from a public relations standpoint. By my way of thinking, and we do a fair amount of B2B influencer marketing at Convince to Convert. By my way of thinking, influencer marketing should be the kind of always on relationships that that really started with public relations. But but in unfortunately, what they typically are is transactional relationships today. And I think that's uh, misguided. I see um, Debbie Fries from um, uh, Top Rank Marketing is uh, listening to us. And, you know, she was with Burrell's Loose for 14 mm -hmm. years before Smart she cookie. joined Top Rank. Ta totally. Top Rank, you know, used to be billed an, as an SEO firm. Mm -hmm. But now they present themselves more as influencer marketing, more, in con more as content marketers. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like SEO yeah. has sort of uh, evolved into content marketing. Um, but a, a lot of times, uh, smaller organizations that don't have the budget maybe to hire an agency to handle their pay-per-click and their SEO or and their content marketing will go one way or the other. Um, any yeah. thoughts on how to choose? I mean, is it better to hire a PPC firm that can also do natural search optimization, organic search optimization, or is it better to hire an organic search optimization firm that can also do your pay-per-click? Well, look, I mean... If you can just have one. Yeah, I think it, increasingly, uh, you know, paid search is is a is a media buy, right? Um, and and so organic search is not. Organic search is content marketing in every way, shape, and form. And and consequently, I, even though we think of those as kind of two sides of the same coin, we 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 say it all the time in the same sentence: organic and paid search. And even for that matter, Eric, organic and paid social, but but paid social and paid search is a media buy, right? With with rich analytics and and a lot of bid management and and uh, you know, multi part ad creation and dynamic content insertion and all the things that that happen with with AI and machine learning to optimize your ad campaigns. Whereas organic search and organic social is not that at all. Uh, at least it's not very much that. So uh, I think if you if you are looking to to accomplish your business objectives by spending money, then you should work with a company that really focuses on spending money wisely and effectively. If you're looking to accomplish your business objectives by creating content, which is another way of spending money, I, I understand that, but but not so much an ad, then you should focus on uh, resources that really do that well. Now, there of course there are companies that do both sides well, but but you know this idea that paid and organic are are, are very close together is really not true. You know, you you have sort of grown two businesses in parallel. I think more, but the two that I'm aware of obviously is the convince and convert media empire mm -hmm. that you've built with these, you know, shows that are huge now. And you also do strategic consulting. Mm -hmm. um, how have, how have, what have you learned about how media appetites have changed in the length of time that you've been producing oh, man, um, all these, 
all these uh, trade oriented programs. Yeah. I mean, we're we're eleven years into it uh, at Convince and Convert. Started off as is just me writing. It's actually not dissimilar from from. Uh, Lee's journey at top rank, uh, speaking of Debbie, but, but, you know, it started off as just me writing blog posts four times a week and then became bigger and bigger and a lot more, um, editors and writers and contributors. And, uh, and, but I, I would say the biggest change that I would identify instantaneously is that, you know, the blog was the engine of everything that we did. Um, and, and there was a real, community around that blog and now that's not really the way most of the internet works um you know we took comments off the site a long time ago um as did many other people and and so now while the blog is still important and we publish new content uh, every week we focus on other forms of what we would consider to be thought leadership, I guess, whether it's our network of podcasts or video series or long form reports and and research studies the 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 modalities that work are different now than they were a decade ago and that i guess shouldn't be a surprise but it has been um definitely important every quarter uh, and certainly every year for my team and i to say okay how do our audience which are primarily marketing professionals with an emphasis in digital how do they want to educate themselves and what can we give them to satiate that desire when you think about, um, you know, the scale between long form and short form content, mm. are there any generalizations you can draw or any lessons learned from what works where? Well, I, I think one of the, th we, we preach this all the time that, that that really is two sides of the same coin, right? That if you want to have good short form content, the best way to do that is to start with long form content, right? The, this atomization of content, which was uh, a term pioneered by Todd uh, Defren. Uh, when he was at uh, shift communications uh, still rings true, you know, creating something that has some real intellectual value to it, whether it's a report or a study or, or research and, and top rank does that a lot with um, uh, interviewing influencers for, for trend pieces, et cetera. And then you take that long form piece and then break it up into a panoply of, of, of short pieces that then lead back to the longer piece and, and encourage a download and lead gen and then lead nurture, et cetera, especially on the B2B side. I think that is by far uh, the best approach. The, the, the biggest challenge that we see today, Eric, with our clients and to some degree ourselves, is this random acts of content, right? That, that we see everywhere, both in social media and, and in other forms of uh, digital communication when, when you know, people are just sort of, well, I guess I'm gonna post something because I feel like something happened that is worth mentioning. And you're never gonna build an audience for that, right? Imagine you turn on Discover Channel and like every night it's like a random show that's only gonna show up once. You know, you, you would never have an audience or imagine, you know, you, 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 you subscribe to a magazine like Sports Illustrated, but one week it is about sports and the next week it's about like jewelry making, you know, you'd be like, wow, this is the weirdest magazine ever. I'm not sure I want to stick this out. And, and a lot of people are actually doing that in social and in digital content today. It's, it is truly random acts of content. Uh, and, and so we are big believers in more episodic style communication. And so um, do you um, steer your clients away from talking about sort of off topic things on their social channels that might allow them to connect with audiences? Uh, oh, I get no problem. Yeah, cooking, no problem with that yeah. type of general interest stuff. No, no, no issues with off topic, especially, uh, and this is going to sound crazy, if it's, if it's off topic that is part of an episodic, right? So one of the people who is really, really good at this is Pat Flynn. Um, from smart passive income and and the other uh, products that he has in the market his new book super fans goes into great detail on this point it's really really well done in my estimation this idea of of giving your fans a peek behind the curtain and so one of the things that that i'm actually trying to do a better job of in my own content uh, especially in my new podcast which is called standing ovation it's for uh, professional speakers is to is to give the audience more of an opportunity to kind of get a sense for what's happening behind the scenes to interact with me and our guests in the real world those kind of things um it it is very effective but i i prefer to to do that um that kind of hey here's my real life as part of a regularly scheduled program as opposed to a random hey here's me at whole foods i think i have a good guess for you for that for Great. your standing ovation. Thanks. Killer speaker um, who teaches speaking. His name great. is Matt Church. 
swaffle oh, I, of I, yeah fantastic out of australia Thank you. yeah i don't know matt but i know of matt that'd be great thanks yeah he's a friend i'm happy to make the introduction thank you um so now you advise clients on marketing strategy mm. but you call yourselves counselors rather than mm -hmm. an agency mm -hmm. what's the difference we don't do a lot of execution work at convince and convert although we are doing a little bit more than ever but for example, we talked earlier about public relations. We talked about uh, paid search. We talked about organic search. You know, all of those require a significant amount of day to day, week to week, month to month, um, uh, you know, paying attention and and twiddling dials. We're just not set up like that. I mean, we we don't have a, a very large team of of people whose job it is to execute tactical campaigns. We have an all senior team that is really responsible for for providing um, strategic plans to clients. And so we, we, we like to say that we write a lot of recipes. We don't cook very many meals, but that's a very conscious business decision on my part. Um, I, I have done the other side of it. I've, I've built full service agencies from scratch and uh, for a number of reasons decided to not do that again. And, and that was off Madison, right? So my firm, uh, I had a couple of firms before that, but yeah, Off Madison was the firm that purchased my firm. Uh, and so I became part of their ecosystem. And that was G's way back in 2005, I think. And they're, and they're Arizona, right? Which is mm -hmm. why many of the folks on your team are Arizona based. Uh, yeah, we still have one, two, three, three or four people on our team uh, in uh, in Arizona. Yeah. Now, you also say that Convince and Convert, which is one of your businesses, focuses on strategy and operations mm -hmm. rather than tactics, tactics mm -hmm. and execution. Yeah. But aren't operations made up of tactics and execution? For sure. Yeah. So you, exactly. But what we do is we we provide strategic plans and operations plans. Uh, so we do a lot of playbook development for clients. So we'll tell you, all right, what you need to do is this, 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 and this. Like exactly. We just won't do it for them. So, so it's a level of granular counsel, which we, which we call operations counsel, um, that a lot of strategy firms won't do, but we don't want to say, Hey, give me, you know, give us your passwords and we'll log in and create your Google ads. Like that's just not a thing that we want to offer to the market. You know, one hot area now, and there was a, a lot of discussion about it at DreamWorks this year, is this area of revenue operations. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't heard about it, if you're listening, it doesn't have to do with accounting or anything like that. It's basically about taking um, the ops people that support sales, the ops people that support marketing, and the ops people that support customer success and bringing them together. So you have one sort of ops team to align all those three departments who may be using disparate software, and you want to aggregate all the data together so you can follow uh, what's happening from, yep. from lead to revenue. Yep. Um, I was going somewhere with that. I mean, it's amazing how much people are, how much attention people are actually paying to <coughs> funnel stages and nurture and, and, and attribution. Right? I've had so many phone calls in the last six months on, on you know, really, ah, operations. Really I remember attribution. Thanks for covering me. Thanks for yeah, covering please. me. <laughs> So, hey, um, would you guys, would you guys ever get into the op operational side of setting up uh, workflows or sequences inside of maybe like, you know, an outbound sequencing tool like outbound, or um, maybe get involved with CRM infrastructure development, not so much doing the work, but setting up the systems, because that's what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. When you get into op saying, yeah. this is the sequence of events, and then they, I guess, have to map it into their software. Would yes. you ever consider actually mapping it out for them on the software side? In the software terms of logging in software, typically not. We do a lot of that, a lot of uh, uh, funnel activation and nurture sequence uh, design. We, we do a lot of uh, higher ed work now, and there's lots of uh, nurtures and touches. And so we we design a lot of those sequences. And so we'll say, okay, email three says this, does this. And then after two more days, email four says this, does this. But generally speaking, we wouldn't log in and actually build uh, that email. We just don't have the we're just not staffed to do that kind of work. And, and ultimately we feel like um, unless you're set up to do that work on behalf of the client over the long haul, by not forcing the client to do it in some ways, you're actually doing them a disservice. We, we don't want them to, uh, to, to have to rely on us because all it's going to do is slow them down eventually. So um, I'm reading this book now, Blitzscaling by Reed Hoffman mm -hmm. with Chris Ye, who was a New York Times writer. It's a fantastic book. Yeah, I've heard that. I haven't read it yet, but I've heard great things about it. 
really a deep book. And um, in his book, Reid Hoffman quotes Greylock venture capitalist Josh Ellman, who said, quote, the best growth teams identify the core insights that get users from curious to activated habitual users, which is squarely what you're doing right now. That's so what does it take to get someone from curious to a habitually activated user? Well, a couple of things. One, and the one that gets overlooked so often, is understanding what questions have to be successfully answered in the mind of the curious to become habitual. What I find, and I do a lot of startup advising and investing, uh, as as you do, Eric, is is a lot of early stage companies and even and even established companies who have a new product or service, they feel like, well, if somebody is curious, right? If they if they do a demo or or a trial or or you know taste the piece of sausage on offer at Sam's Club, then instantly and and inexorably they will become. Uh, a habitual user because geez you know they sat into the demo it's like yeah but just because you you tried something doesn't mean you're ready to use it in your day-to-day existence and so there's a big psychological chasm between trial and habit and and most organizations don't spend enough time thinking about what those psychological um, uh, needs are and saying how, how can we overcome those objections, even if they're not objections, or, or satiate those needs uh, in the mind of the potential customer. So we do a lot of work along those lines at Convince and Convert, where, where we do a lot of rich segmentation studies of, of clients and prospective clients, and, and a lot of what we call the five by five by five process, where we take your, your five personas and your five kind of classic funnel stages, and then determine what are the five questions that must be successfully answered for a prospect to go down one level in the funnel. And so we try to almost reverse engineer it to say, all right, if somebody is going to become a habitual user, what 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 they what must they say yes to in their head to be habitual? Before they get there, what must they say yes to? Before they get there, what must they say yes to? Yes to? And then essentially create content that fulfills all those needs all the way down that kind of shoots and ladders approach. So I think that's the biggest problem is that people think that trial equals habit. And or you can just say, well, the ratio of people who who try something who become habitual is 4%. Therefore, our work here is done. And that ain't the case. Is there some sort of logical order to the questions? Generally speaking, yes. They're, they're going to go from the generic to the specific, right? They're going to go from... Um, uh, from, from what can this product or service do for me at the top end? And then towards the bottom, it's okay. Well, what if I I believe you're the right solution? What if something happens? Like what's your service, um, contract or what's your cancellation clause, right? So there's this sort of, all right, uh, what do you do? What do you do versus competitors? Is this right for me? Which version of your thing is perfect for me? Okay. Now I believe you. And now what happens if it all goes to shit? Like that's sort of the general approach um, that, that we see. You know, it's funny. A lot of that type of work is being done now in this category, emerging category called sales enablement. Mm-hmm. And there are actually these um, uh, digital asset management tools that are being developed for sales departments Amazing. where, you know, you put the sales decks in there, you put the pitch decks in there, you put the case studies in there, and then you can actually see which one of those got used and then which one led to successful, Absolutely. you know, deals. Yep. Yeah. And we have a lot of, of a lot of partners in that space. Like we do a lot of work with Uber flip, which is a great content experience platform. That is a lot of that kind of work. And, and also uh, co-schedule is one of our partners and they have a very cool uh, digital asset manager um, uh, package, which is really inexpensive and it's growing really quickly because a lot of your dams are really expensive and very feature laden. It's kind of like, you know, a nightmare version of Excel where it's like a million things to click on, but you're only going to use 10% and they've really stripped it down, which I think is a smart way to go to market. All right, let's have kind of a difficult conversation. Okay, I'm ready. We're, we're the guys to do it. We've been around right. long enough to have this conversation. We, okay. We're grownups. We can do this. All right. Okay? All right. So on your website, uh, you use being fast, fair, and easy to work with as a differentiator. Mm-hmm. Why are so many agencies slow, unfair, and difficult to work with? Well, I guess first we should accept that the premise is true. I, I believe it is true. I wouldn't have written that copy, and I did write that copy. Um, I, I guess fair is probably the one there that that is probably the least 
um, universally true. I, I, I guess I shouldn't suggest that that other agencies are not fair, although I have certainly seen that from time to time. Um, from a speed perspective, uh, my observation, having worked with lots of agencies and been a part of a lot of agencies, is they're just typically not tuned. They're just not tuned operationally for speed to be um, a a prime directive, right? Um, there's there's lots of of uh, anecdotes out there of of people, you know, sending a, an email or a contact us form to an agency, and it takes them a week to get back. And then, meanwhile, the prospective client's got an acute need. It, just, it happens all the time, and I think partially it's because of the way agencies are set up, in that everybody there has lots and lots of balls in the air, and they're working on lots of different things, and so uh, prioritization can be difficult. So we have tried to 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 take that away uh and we really are super responsive when i'm not in an airplane we typically respond on my side within 60 minutes and uh all of our clients actually have access to a special email address which is now at convinceandconvert.com which goes to every person in the company it, it's like a distribution list so our clients uh, know that if they need something immediately they don't have to go to the regular account manager they can send it to now at and it goes to everybody on the team and whomever is the most appropriate will jump on it and they'll hear back in a minute, two minutes, that kind of thing. Um, when you think about, about the fair mm. distinction, um, if you were to apply that across, say, um, a portfolio of clients starting at the bottom from an early stage company, a startup, maybe pre-funded all the way up to maybe a monopoly or an institution of some kind that's not really in a competitive environment, do you think that um, they tend to gravitate to agencies that tend to be either fair or less fair based on the size that they're at? Um, do people at the bottom get taken advantage of more? Oh, I mean, that's probably true. Uh, I don't think of it that way very often, but yeah, that that's that. Yeah. I mean, logic would dictate that that's the scenario, but when I think about fairness, um, you know, we mentioned this earlier. One of the things that I think about from from the perspective of convince and convert versus other professional services firms is sort of like what I was nodding to earlier. Like we don't want to hold you hostage. Like we we don't want to give you solutions or circumstances um, that that mandate or or even or even significantly handicap you insofar as that you really need to keep working with us. Like we don't want to set up a scenario for our clients where the switching cost is so high. I'll give you an example. Once our initial strategic planning work is done, every client we have and every client we've ever had is on a 30 day contract. My role is look, if you don't want to, if you no longer find value in working with my team and I don't pay us anymore, like we don't do annual contracts. We don't do any of that. Like, it's like, look, if it's not working, it's not working. Uh, and, and that's not the way a lot of the agency world thinks about um, how they, how they do things. Now you work with companies and agencies of 25 employees and up. Typically, at least that's what it says on your website. Is that, is that true? Yeah, that's true. Although, the, you know, as a, as a matter of course, at, at this juncture, you know, generally speaking, we're working with, um, with organizations that are in the, you know, $250 million a year and up range. And, and many of our clients now are, are fortune 50 clients. Um, we, I think where we work best now is, is doing specific things for very large companies. We're not big enough, nor do we want to do, you know, huge enterprise things for huge enterprise companies. We, we, um, although we sometimes say sort of jokingly that we're McKinsey, but fun, we don't have the, we, we don't have the bandwidth or the personnel to do McKinsey style projects where we're going to go out and, you know, figure out how to do your insurance billing globally for the next seven years. Uh, you know, we, we, we can't operate on that big of a canvas, but, but I think our best projects are, are very specific, acute uh, marketing or customer experience oriented needs for, for big companies who understand the value of solving those problems. So, so that's where you're focused now, but I'm fortunate enough to have you on this call with me right now. So for the purposes of this webinar, yes. if I was at an early stage startup and I needed help with a go-to-market strategy mm -hmm. and a go-to-media strategy, mm -hmm. what questions would you ask me? Well, we'd, we'd ask you first and foremost, um, Let's to, role play it. Ask yeah. Me. So we'd say so we're doing this. I'm at the early stage startup. I came to you. Yeah. What do I do? 
Uh, it's funny you say that. We we just had a, a client kickoff today. We're not an early stage startup, but but definitely more of an entrepreneurial venture. And so the things that we want to know are how do you actually make money, right? So we need to have a really deep understanding of of the path to revenue, and and all the current stages to get somebody there. Uh, we'll want to look at um, as much information as you currently have about your target audiences and, and how they differ. And, and frankly, Eric, this won't come as a surprise. I think that's the place that most early stage startups have a huge hole because all of their um, quote unquote insights about their audiences is purely anecdotal or based in intuition. And, and so what I always want to do in that kind of circumstance where working with startups is to say, man, what we really need here is some legitimate audience research. Now, sometimes they don't, they can't fund it or don't want to fund it or whatever the circumstances are, but that's oftentimes what they need because they're just, you know, somebody sat in a conference room with pizza and said, oh, here's what our customers want based on nothing, based on the gut feel of the founder, which is not a super great way to run most businesses. Um, and then we also do a real deep scan on all anything that's happening already. So, um, you know, of course, all the different analytics in all the different um, uh, places. We'll look at current media coverage, social listening, you know, web analytics, email analytics, social analytics, all, all the different things. And then we'll do a lot of uh, interviews of, of company personnel. So we do a lot of stakeholder interviews inside the organization. And then especially, especially, especially uh, for early stage companies, we'll do a lot of customer and prospective customer interviews as well, because we want to hear it from their side. Um, it's it's fascinating when, when you ask um, the marketing director of an early stage company what the company stands for, where they're positioned in the market, what prospective customers would find value in, and then you ask a customer the same questions, sometimes you get very different answers. And that in and of itself can be very telling and frankly, very useful for the company. Any generalizations with respect to early stage companies and the peso model? Um, are some media uh, formats a better fit? Do you find like when they start, should they just be sharing or should do they go great straight to paid? I mean, you look at like uh, Russell, uh, you know, the quick funnel guy mm -hmm, and he's out there promoting paid for people mm -hmm. who are just starting out. And then some people would say, ah, no, don't do paid until you have a product market fit, you know, start with shared. Yeah. Are there any generalizations you could draw about which media channel works best for a company based on their stage in development? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know that I could, that I could classify that by stage. I, I might, I might make some, I might think about that by company type and what, and what they're selling. And also, um, and also path to purchase, right? Th this is where, this is where price and value of product and service really comes into play. Like I was on a, a client call today, and um, they're they're in the medical world, and and they were bemoaning the fact that they had um, spent some time and effort in paid social and and hadn't seen a return. To which I said, well, okay, but given what it is that you sell. Like, is there any likelihood on the planet that somebody is going to see a Facebook ad for that and be like, yeah, put me in coach? Like, it's uh, it's just not how people make decisions. Now, as as an assisted conversion, right, as with paid social as another uh, another touch point that helps your sales and marketing and direct mail and everything else work better for sure. But But I think sometimes people don't understand that it really is a marketing mix, right? So I actually take a little bit of issue with the question. It's it's not about paid versus owned or earned versus shared. It, it's about what are the relative percentages of each? Because the answer is you need all of them eventually. Right. Hey, um, I've just been sort of playing with a little model here. Let me see cool. if I can put it on the screen. And I'd like to talk it through with you. I just can did you, it up can before you our screen call. share on there. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try. Let's see if I can here. Um, I like this tool, by the way. I haven't used this one. I really like it. Okay, that's not it. I'm just trying to figure out how to change it. Thanks, uh, my buddy Bob Cooney, who um, is a virtual reality uh, advisor, uses it for a weekly um, conference call that or weekly webinar that he does. Huh? It seems like it's it's bugging out on me. 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Now, I know he picked it because he wanted to be able to do um, live video and, and presentations. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it up. Hold on. Let me just try. I don't want to take it down, but now, okay, share your screen. And then it's, no, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, oh, well, let me just look at it here. So, so I sort of broke it down. I broke down um, the different stages of a of a company or even a, an individual's entrepreneurial mm -hmm. consulting business, whatever. Yep. A, a self published author could be anything. Um, to these stages, you know, you're sort of in the startup phase, and when you're in the startup phase, you know, it's all about working capital. It's all about sales and pitch decks. It's about mm -hmm. outbound sales sequences, and it's about an MVP. You know, a minimum viable product. And, uh, you know, once that's under wraps, then you're looking for a product market fit, as you were just saying, you know, do I really have something that the market wants? What does the market want? What do I think they want? How do I sort of close the gap there? And so I said, you know, you go from startup to the sort of change up mode, or as others have called it, the pivot mode. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you make it through there, then you try to scale up and that's growth. That's the growth mode. And at that point, you're into conversion optimization and you got a customer success team to, you know, circumvent churn and maybe you're even doing some you know cxpr customer experience public relations and then of course if you go past there to the next stage you become a grown-up and you're into profitability <laughs> and at that point you're you know you're looking at data science you're looking at um you know aligning sales marketing customer service and you're looking at uh internal communications to make sure people are happy yep. your employees are happy so startup change up scale up grown up. Mm -hmm. If you think about those four stages, um, I would, I'm, I, I'm trying to get to a sort of hierarchy of strategic communications needs mm -hmm. based on those four stages. So are there any generalizations you could say from a strategic communication standpoint of like what you need from a strat com standpoint at the startup yeah. phase I, I, versus I, I, the I change mean, up, yeah, scale maybe. up, grown up phase? Maybe, I guess, I haven't, I haven't thought about that exact question in a while. So this is um, real-time consulting, which is the worst kind of consulting to do. Um, but I think you said in the in the last one, the grown-up phase, I think you said internal comms. And and by my way of thinking, I would almost I would almost go with concentric circles inside out that when you think about strategic communications the first thing you need to do is to make sure that everybody who who carries your business card is totally aligned to the mission the values the storytelling of the organization and then the next concentric circle is your early stage customers and the next customer is the next stage of customers and then eventually the circle gets bigger so so instead of a kind of a a, a, a stair step model or a ladder or or, or a quadrant uh, that you had thought of. I, I almost might think of a of a um, of a target, right? Where where you where you get communications right um, to the people who are closest to the company first, and then as the company expands, communications alignment can expand as well. So almost like a a ripples in a pond metaphor, if that makes sense. Again, that's off the top of my head, so that could be ridiculous. That's cool. I like that. Hey, um, for early stage companies and pre VC funded startups, w when when they're sort of shopping mm -hmm. for help, yeah, um, and let's say they they want uh, third party endorsements, mm -hmm. uh, media relations, and um, influencer relations, yep, um, and they're talking to agencies and they're talking to uh, sole practitioners and big agencies, small agencies, boutiques, mid sized, large. Mm -hmm. um, are there any red flags you think they should be looking for when they're evaluating PR agencies to hire? Well, look, this is the this is a story as old as as newspapers. Like, I, I don't think you ever want to be somebody's smallest client because uh, you're not going to get their best people. It's just you know, it, it's real truth, right? I mean, that's the way the agency business works. And and when agencies lose clients, 
um, it, it's, it's usually for two reasons, right? Either they believe that another big firm can provide better, more creative solutions, or the client believes that they're getting the C team within the agency and they're sick of getting the C team, right? And so if I'm a small company, and I, as, as you know, I'm invested in probably 30 small tech startups, so I get this question all the time, you, you, you don't want to be the small fish in the big pond, um, especially as an early stage company, because you're just not going to get the best and brightest of that agency. And um, so I, I always want to right size the company to the professional services being provided. Beyond the size of the company mm-hmm. and the, the, are there any sort of, you know, red flags that when you're hearing the pitch yeah. you're looking for? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm a little, so a lot of tech companies only want to work with tech PR firms or, or they only want to work with somebody who does SaaS cause they're SaaS or whatever the circumstances are. And, and I totally understand that. And I don't think it's a bad idea. But what the question I would always ask, and I would ask it this way, is we are a B2B SaaS company. It appears as though many of your clients are also B2B SaaS companies. What processes do you use inside your agency to ensure that the recommendations that you provide are specifically oriented to the needs of my company? Because what you don't want is is an agency that's like, well, this is our B2B SaaS playbook. And it's the same playbook that we use for every single company, regardless of what they do. Like you just don't want that kind of paint by numbers approach. And I think you can tell a lot about an agency by how they answer that one question. If um, if you were to prioritize the, the different factors on which um, one might rank an agency, mm. what would be more important, uh, sector experience, relationships with media in that sector or um, experience at with companies at that stage in their corporate development? That's an interesting query. I think I would, well, I would, I would opt for door number four, which is demonstrated results would, would be, um, and, and, and independent testimonials it would be really what I would look for. But given the three that you gave me, I think sector experience would be number one. Um, uh, number two would would be sort of um, uh, companies like mine and uh, and and relationships. I would put that third only because it's very very difficult to verify that every agency is going to say that they have relationships, but how you you can't really put that to the test very easily. Um, so I wouldn't put a ton of stock in that. What about average length of the agency's retainer relationship? You think that's a good metric? Um, it's a good question. I think it's certainly worth asking about uh, as as a data point for sure. I mean, to some degree, it can be a false positive because of how they choose to uh, structure their own contracts, and 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 certainly for agencies that focus on early stage companies. Uh, I'm not certain it's a great success metric only because ultimately, look, if if you're if you're the type of PR firm or communication shop or really any professional services, it could be an accounting firm that specializes in in early stage growth companies and you do your job, that company is going to grow and eventually they're going to outgrow you. That's just the way it works. And so, you know, at some level, I could argue the opposite, right? Like if they've got short relationships, it's because they're successful growing the companies fast enough that they then, you know, get to the point where they need somebody bigger, maybe. So in the um, sort of like the, the old, you know, like the old, the old, uh, the old debate, Eric, where people say, well, um, you know, how how important is time on the website? Well, on one hand, you say, you know, it's great because people are spending a lot of time. Another hand is maybe they can't find it, so they're looking around, right? So you, right. you know, you don't you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, boy, with all this data out there, you know, reading the tea leaves is becoming tougher and tougher. And I think well, we are you know, surrounded it's, it's, by data, but starved. It's starved beca- yeah, it's becoming easier and easier to pull the wrong conclusions from data. So in this book, again, that I mentioned earlier, yeah, Blitzscaling, mm-hmm. um, he talks about the different stages of development. And here's his hierarchy. Okay. Um, family, tribe, mm-hmm. village, city state and nation okay that's the trajectory when you think about those different 
monikers in a mm -hmm. hierarchy mm -hmm. to define a client in, um, in their development arc. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any, any sort of broad um, ideas that come to mind of who needs what from a strategic communication standpoint? Like does the family and the tribe need something completely different from the village and the city or the state and the nation? If you if you assume that that family are sort of employees and tribe are kind of early stage customers or advocates on behalf of the organization, and maybe village are business partners or other disproportionate stakeholders, absolutely, right? I mean, you, I think you have to think of that as a segmented marketing communications approach. That that's why internal comms is different from external comms. That's why partner marketing exists as a discipline. Uh, so all of those are true. Um, you know, once you get to um, sort of large scale status, I think those differences become, um, at least to the external audiences, less important. But yeah, I mean, and I'll tell you, we've written a lot of books about this. Like one of the biggest mistakes we see marketers make is focusing so much on external audiences and not enough on internal audiences, right? It, like, you know, I've said this a million times, like if, if your employees aren't your biggest advocates, you got to start there. Like, why are you worrying about, you know, creating an influencer marketing program if your employees aren't bought in? Uh, you know, you, you really have to, you have to start with family first. Um, let's uh, talk for a moment about the different media outlets that you have at Convince and Convert. Yeah. Um, let's talk about social pros. Mm -hmm. So social pros has been around for how long now? Uh, January 2012 was our first episode of that podcast. Uh, I yesterday recorded episode 409, I think. Okay. And so what, from an advertiser's perspective, mm -hmm. who does that show help me reach as an advertiser? Uh, enterprise social media managers and digital marketers in medium-sized and in large companies uh, worldwide with an emphasis in north america something like 75 percent of the social pros listening audience according to our recent survey have purchasing authority uh for for SaaS software so if you're a martech organization who's trying to reach people who do digital and social it's a it's a good place to to be and 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 how does it work? Like if I want to advertise on the show, how do I do yeah, that? Yeah, so it's simple. So, you know, generally speaking, because we have a lot of um, a lot of thought leadership and in, in, uh, content assets that convince and convert, it's pretty rare that somebody would come to us and say, I just want to be part of social pros. Usually there's a number of things that we would do with them at convince and convert, which might include uh, sponsorship of the podcast. It might include um, the sponsorship of our email products. It might include a webinar or a webinar or videos or reports or blogs. So, you know, usually 95% of the time, it's a real uh, cross section of, of things. Um, so, so that like any other form of marketing or advertising, you know, sort of doing one thing a handful of times typically doesn't work that well. So usually when we layer different, um, uh, components into a program, it works much better. But but for social pros or really all of our podcasts, it's pretty easy. We always do host reads. So um, in the show, at the beginning of the show, sponsors mentioned early in the show, I do a live read. I write them all myself. I do them all myself uh, and acknowledge the sponsor and talk about why I like the sponsor and, and how we use them at Convince and Convert for our clients. And then we mention them again at the end and then they're referenced on the website and, and all that kind of stuff. But that's, it's pretty, pretty typical. And is an ad in a podcast forever or do you dynamically shift them out? The way we do it for now is is it is forever. Um, so it actually for, for for sponsors who who were with us in the early days, they've got a tremendous amount of of uh, off book value as the show continues to succeed after all these years. There is of course technology to dynamically insert the ads um, ex post facto. We we have not utilized that technology yet uh, at Convince and Convert, but it's certainly something we're thinking about for this year. If you were to look at um, the podcast part of your business standalone, mm -hmm. not in not in in uh, you know um, in a package of things mm -hmm. that you sell yeah. to advertisers, yeah. is would it be uh, profitable just by itself? Oh sure, yeah, of course. We don't do anything that's not profitable by itself. Life's too short and the team's too small. But but how you can't really measure it because you know you're. It's sort of a cumulative sale. Yeah, but you we know, know give you this, but, that, and the other. But we know when we do a program for a client, 
uh, we say we're going to do this, 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 and this together, but they're all line itemed. So we know, we know what the value is or the value that's been put upon the podcast sponsorship versus other assets. So yeah, we know, we know, we know what that, we know exactly what revenue podcast sponsorships brings to the organization each year. When you look at, when you compare that to mm-hmm. the video program that you do, mm-hmm. uh, uh, talk triggers. Yeah. Talk triggers is not one that's sponsored and that was intentional. And, and so talk triggers, talk triggers doesn't take any advertising at all. Right. Yeah. For a couple of reasons. One is it was much more about, uh, customer experience and word of mouth and kind of tied into the new book that I wrote with Daniel Lemon. So it was much more of a position and thought leadership exercise, uh, for me and for the organization. And so we also were doing a little bit differently uh, from a modality standpoint with a show that was more native to YouTube. So we just didn't want to get into the whole, uh, sponsorship side of it for that one. But you're still invested in that show. That show's still live. Uh, we're so it's not it's live, but we're not making new shows. So so that was a, a twenty episode run, and, and so see. that run is concluded. And so now, Stand Innovation is the new show. And so what, the thing that we're doing a lot of now is is sort of planned obsolescence and say, okay, we're going to do twenty episodes or forty episodes or fifty episodes or however many episodes make sense in this format. And then we feel like we've said the things we want to say we're going to, we're going to then move on to the next thing and, and do that. And, um, I really like that approach. I think it's wise. It's something that we work with a lot of our clients on as well. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll have a couple of new things at some point this year. We just don't have them off the ground yet. Do you try to keep that sort of content feature oriented? So it has a longer shelf life. Yeah. Do you like consciously stay away from news? Yes. And we always have, I mean, even social pros, uh, is not a news show. I mean, we, we, we talk about uh, social media strategy and social media tactics with with big company social media practitioners. And and insofar as, you know, we weren't talking about TikTok two years ago, uh, the show is certainly of the moment, but it's not a news show. It's it's not a podcast, which is here's what's happening in social media right now. That's not what it's about. Uh, in fact, and neither is our blog. Like we don't write news posts. We, we just never have like the 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 mission I've always given our team from an editorial standpoint is we are in the and therefore business. And what I mean by that is there's lots of people out there who are in the news business. Facebook did this, Twitter did that, YouTube did this, you know, um, email did that. Great. Please cover that. Knock yourselves out. People come to us to say this happened. And therefore we must now dot, dot, dot. Our role is to be in the and therefore business. That's, that's what we try and handle. Very well said. You know, I, I love your your Midwestern uh, clarity. You know, <laughs> ra- rather than my mother was yeah, an English ahead. teacher, it helps a lot. Yeah. Well, uh, Jay Bear, thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are. Oh man, thanks uh, it's a blast. With everything it's good you to catch do. up. And so it's really nice of you to take the time to do this. It's I really appreciate it. it. It's good to see you. Love uh, love what you're doing here. Really cool and uh, always nice to spend some time with you, my friend. Likewise. Um, hey, join us next week. I know you actually have on the current episode. Oh, of, so good. Um, did you read it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I read I the whole thing. I just started yeah. it. I just got it. It's I just started awesome. it. And it's gripping. It's so well written. Yep, I love and it. I'm, I'm, I'm into it. And so next week, guys, um, David Merman Scott actually wrote kind of the first book, um, a New, Rules in Marketing, Mar- a New Rules of Marketing and PR, which was really – I mean, it's, it's, he, he was the first guy to write sort of the book about how social and the internet would change the business of PR. Um, and so I'm really grateful to have him. Uh, we'll have him next week. So um, hope to see you there. You can ask him questions there. And if you want to hear about it now, hop on over to uh, Social Pros Podcast. The current episode uh, is up. I know I'm going to listen to it. Thanks. Uh, just to get ready for my interview with, uh, with um, David Merman Scott next week. Thanks. Yeah, we actually did something different on that episode. We went through the book, uh, my, my co-host and I, and pulled out a bunch of uh, poll quotes. So it's a really great poll quotes book. And then we used the poll quotes to structure the episode and asked David, okay, you said this and just respond to it. It's just really fun. And then uh, one of David's super fans, this is a little bit more story than you care about, but one of David's super fans happens to be the guy who runs the yard service which takes care of my yard. And so he was talking to my wife and da da da. And he said, does Jay know David Meerman Scott? And she's like, yeah, he knows David Meerman Scott. In fact, he's going to be on Jay's podcast. He's like, he is. And so one of the things that David talks about in that book is also kind of like Pat Flynn, letting your fans in on the action. And so I had 
the yard guy who owns the yard guy company on the podcast as well. So he got to listen in right here in the office, right next to me and ask David questions on the podcast. It was really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It was really neat. Great idea. Yeah. It was fun. Cool. Uh, what, what are you working on another book? Not yet. I'm working on a brand new keynote, uh, called coveted customer experience, uh, which will launch uh, February 1st. So the way I operate is I start with a keynote and I deliver that keynote, um, a few dozen times around the world and get it to the point where I really like it. And then if I feel like there's market need and market fit, then I'll turn it into a book. So we're, we're sort of at step one of what may become a book. Interesting. So for you, the keynote is sort of the testing ground. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because I'm doing and a based on the feedback and it. everything. No, and it gives you a chance to perfect the stories and the narrative flow. And, and actually it makes it right in the book a lot easier because you already have the, the 60 or 90 minute kind of arc um, of, of the keynote and then just sort of flesh that into a book. You just sort of add stories and add structure. Uh, I really like that approach. It's worked, uh, it's worked well for me. And, and ultimately, you know, I'm going to do one keynote a week. I'm not going to write one book a week. So it's, you know, just from a practice standpoint, it's easier for me to work it out on stage than to work it out on the page. And where will the debut keynote be? Um, it's it's actually not going to be a public uh, uh, debut. We're going to kind of launch it in social and through content with some blog posts and social media assets to kind of talk about the premise of the keynote uh, and things like that. Um, so there isn't like a, a physical launch in an auditorium, um, at least not yet. Great. Well, hey, thanks so much for taking the time and uh, hope to catch up with you again soon. Thanks, but yeah, let's do it again anytime. See you later. Take care.